So we're here at the Embedded World 2018. And uh, hi, so who are you? Hi, I'm uh, Rick O'Connor. I'm the executive director of the RISC-V Foundation. So uh, you are like uh, the president, right? The yes, yes, there is no president per se. It's a non-profit foundation looking after the RISC-V ISA. So and, you started this foundation? And I run the foundation. I was, uh, I was behind starting the foundation with a bunch of member companies who are founders. So there's a lot of logos right here. Does exactly. All these companies are part of the foundation? Right, we have over 80 um, member organizations, commercial companies and universities, as well as an additional 50 individual members. This is like it's very Google, active. ETH, Zurich, MediaTek. What are they doing? What is it, Qualcomm, NVIDIA? What does it mean to be a member of the foundation? Well, the, the foundation looks after the RISC-V instruction set architecture that originated at UC Berkeley. And what the foundation is responsible for is making sure that that specification remains free and open and available to all users. Uh, no, no charge, it's a free and open instruction set architecture that you can use, as well as extend the roadmap and, um, and um, promote and educate and increase awareness around RISC-V. So when did they start the RISC-V? Well, uh, so the, the project at Berkeley started in the spring of 2010. And they thought at that they were looking at that time for new instructions or new new curriculum for their undergraduate and graduate program to teach computer architecture and programming. Just eight years ago. That's when the re original research started around, and the idea was, okay, hey, we could have a little three-month project in the spring, create a, a very simple ISA that we could then use in the fall semester. Well, four years later, that three-month project, four years later, uh, produced the first formally released RISC-V specification, and many tape outs for test chips and research publications along the way, such that the community, the industry at large, started to realize that, hey, this was something interesting going on at Berkeley, and the team at Berkeley decided that this needed to exist outside of the university because of the amount of interest that was going on in industry. So the foundation was created, and now we have 80, 80 some odd member companies. But, uh, you were not at the university where they did that, right? That's right. I you met. Were not. I'm, no, I was not. I, no, no, no I, I'm not a Berkeley alum. Uh, I met uh, Kirsten Osanovich and, and Dave Patterson uh, early. Uh, well, I started talking to the team probably around. Are they professors? Yeah. So Kirsten yeah. is what the lead researcher at Berkeley. Dave Patterson is quite famous in the risk world. He he coined the term risk. risk Risk industrial The original reduced. risk papers were his? In the 80s. Yeah. So a pattern. The ones that inspired ARM, right? And inspired at, the, at the very beginning, yes. before ARM and MIPS and, and all of those companies. So Patterson and, he and Hennessy, anybody who's taken an engineering, you know, computer architecture design course in, in engineering schools would have had a Patterson and Hennessy textbook. And that's Dave Patterson from Berkeley and Hennessy from Stanford. So he and those two, they did that program in 2010? Correct. And some students worked on that? Yep, PhD students and so on worked on that. And they designed something completely different? or From the ground up, completely new ISA. It's not a, it's not a copy of anything that's before? It's, it's informed by, so if you have the opportunity to do something from a clean slate, but you have three decades or more of history on what works well in a, in a risk machine, and what maybe doesn't work so well in a risk machine, um, you know, you can, you can be informed by that history to do something quite good. And the, so basically, they're sitting down, they're thinking of an instruction set. It's like yep. a creative process where yep. you think, we need this, 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 but yep. we don't need that, exactly. or something like that. Exactly, this, these things were bad, these things are good, let's have this. Uh, build test chips, test it out, publish research papers, get feedback, and that resulted in the publications that started in 2014, the first base integer spec release in 2014, and then the creation of the foundation to manage the rest of the specification stack. So, um, what is uh, version one, two, three, four, five? What, what is it, five? Ah, that's a good, 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 good question. It's not RISC-V, it is RISC-V, as in Roman, Roman numeral five, uh, which represents the fifth RISC-based research project that originated at Berkeley. So RISC-1 was back in the 80s under Patterson's original research, and oh. there was a RISC-2. Three and four were kind of not named three and four, they were sore and spur, but yeah. they were other editions of the, of, of the research work. So this was the fifth time that team started to do more RISC-based research, if you will, hence RISC-5. So it's reduced 
instruction set? Computing. Computing? It's actually computing, right? It's not the... Uh, it's computing. Yeah. And uh, so that's the better way than the, the, the CISC. That's yeah, the, it's the Intel is a mess, isn't it? I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> but uh, it, like, uh, it's better to have a reduced instruction set. Oh, certainly the, 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 the modern learning around uh, computer architecture is that risk-based approaches uh, are better. You can get, generate more performance at a better price point uh, using a risk uh, approach to your computer design. Intel is not on this board? is not on this board. No, no. they don't. They don't like it, or uh, might. I wouldn't say that. Uh, they're not a member yet. But some of the Risk Five uh, staff, maybe they came over from Intel. Some of them. Oh, and other companies and so on. And yeah. and certainly, the research that all this was sponsored under inside Berkeley. Uh, you know, Intel continues to be a major research sponsor for the work yeah. at Berkeley, right? So, yeah. uh, you don't need to be a member to use Risk Five. Right. Uh, obviously, from my standpoint, we welcome all parties. It's one big happy sandbox, and everybody, all the kids can come and play in the sandbox. But ARM is not here neither, right? Because uh, this is the challenge not, for ARM. Is not, that what it is? Not all, member com not all companies on the planet are members. That is true. So, and you've raised two, obviously, high-profile, important yeah, processor yeah. companies. This is arguably one of the most interesting uh, things that has happened in the processor industry in the last decade. And you know, my job is to talk to everybody. So it's a challenge to the arm, right? Um, Isn't it what it is? And as much, a good example is Microsoft and Linux. Okay, when Linux first sort of hit the hit, hit the road, it was you know came on the scene. It was like, oh, what's going to happen to? Well, and if you look at Microsoft's platforms these days, they're one of the largest uh, you know Linux users uh, on the on the planet, right? So it's it's not. Uh, about one company versus another. It's, a, it's an approach to bringing an open standard for an ISA into the marketplace that everyone can use. Right? So we don't think of it as a us versus them for anybody. But who's FreeBSD then? What do you mean, who's FreeBSD? No, I'm just joking. I'm saying maybe there's uh, Windows, Linux, and then there's FreeBSD. Yeah. Uh, as a, like, uh, there, there could be several different like open ecosystem kind of, of places, right? Yep. And it actually, that's, a, that's an interesting point. When you, when you look at all of the major building blocks for a computer system, whether it's OSs, whether there it's network interfaces, whether it's chip-to-chip -chip interfaces, whether it's wireless interfaces, there are open standards for all of those pieces of technology. There is not today yet, or hasn't been until RISC-V, an open standard around an ISA. So why not? Why shouldn't there be? And that's, that's fundamentally what RISC-V brings to the table. Is the ARM argument that uh they need to invest in making new chips, and uh, and the license fee is actually quite small. That's a question you'd have to ask ARM. That's the way they do, right? Because most of the the companies that do uh, license the ARM, they're like, uh, it's it's not a big part of their expense to pay the license, is it? Or so there's there's a an open platform, you know, has has a number of benefits. The licensing. Is a, is a portion of it, right? uh, to your, to your point. Because then they spend a lot of money to customize it later. Yeah, but so... so they can still so, be doing that with RISC-V, right? So, but, but the freedom to do whatever you want, because it's an open ISA, is, is there. And the level, of, the level of innovation that we've unleashed as a result of having an open ISA in the marketplace, you and I could start a processor company in your kitchen tomorrow. We don't need a license or permission from anybody to do so. So what we're experiencing is we're harnessing the best and brightest minds from industry and academia around the world working on RISC V and, hel and helping to solve problems using RISC V. By our estimation, there's roughly 80 universities to date that have adopted RISC V at the uh, undergraduate and graduate levels for the for their curriculum as a pedagogical tool, All right? So it's it, it's quite interesting watching the momentum of both you know companies as you've as you've already, we've already talked about uh, and and academia in the adoption of RISC V. Is there any interoperability between the the ARM ecosystem and RISC V? Is there any way that software can still work over there somehow? Or that has to be recompiled everything. Uh, so. Yeah, it's a different it's a different binary, 
right? So it has to be uh, recompiled. But there's uh, there's Linux support. There's actually there's just been a Fedora release uh, for for Linux. Uh, there's toolchain uh, work going on in the ecosystem. GCC upstream, Vanutils upstream, LLVM working. So the community is you know bringing the bringing the ecosystem up and the toolchain up around RISC-V. All right, and uh, uh, maybe. I'm just thinking, maybe, I don't know if that's true, but uh, sometimes, for example, when uh, some companies are doing ARM servers, they kind of use that as a pressure point against Intel so they don't have too high of prices. Maybe there are some of the companies are using RISC-V as like, not, I don't know if it's a threat or not, but against ARM and saying, hey, if you try to increase the, or if you can't lower your license, then we have an alternative going on. Is that maybe, is it possible? Uh, you know, freedom of choice, I think, is good for everybody in the industry, ultimately. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, it provides pressure points in different parts, but there's, to say that that's a, an overwhelming theme, there's way too much activity in the ecosystem for that to be a, a mainstream reason. Are some people doing it? Probably, right? But uh, to suggest that it's why people would be interested in this five exclusively is, is, is one part of the benefit of RISC-V. The, there are characteristics of the ISA that are unlike anything else that let you build different architectures uh, in, a, in a very interesting way and have uh, the ISA being used in deeply embedded IoT devices, very small devices, right through to server scale. And no other instruction set architecture can do that. So right now you have one in here. There's an actual RISC V here hardware. Real, it is real, real RISC V chip. Yeah. How many RISC V chips exist? Like this, this. What is this one? This so this is from Sci, this is from Sci Five. It's a little embedded controller from Sci Five, uh, and this was a badge that uh, was designed for our last workshop uh, that Ant Micro, one of the member companies, designed together with uh, with Sci Five, uh, with an e ink display. Just as a toy and a you know conversation piece. But is that the is that the sci-fi chip that can run Linux? No, this is an earlier version. There is an, more of an embedded controller. The sci-fi chip that runs Linux is just being released, and the development board is uh, I think available now or will be shortly. Is this 8-bit, 32-bit? It's a 32-bit controller. You don't do any 8-bit. Uh, no, 8-bit doesn't actually make sense really anymore. Yeah. You know, there's no point. Uh, we have 32-bit with compressed uh, ISA down to 16. So uh, this is like kind of like a Cortex M yeah, M zero ish, kind of, yeah, M zero ish, yeah. But you, do you have something bigger already taped out? So you say all the I, way up to I, servers. Yeah. So I, I want to be clear. So yeah. when you say you, uh, the, the foundation, no, ecosystem. Yeah, ecosystem, you're right. Yeah. So uh, part of my role in, as the executive director of the foundation, I get to see behind the curtain of no. all of our members. Uh, clearly, I don't get to talk about where they're what they're doing until they're ready to talk about oh, yeah, what they're yeah. doing, right? Uh, but I can tell you that we have member activity at every point along that ecosystem. Like from hardware coming. Yep. And when you talk all the way up to server, that means a big chip. Big, big, it's gonna big, big chip. server scale chip. But yep. uh, what is it going to be designed out of? Uh, I mean, uh, because does that mean you have something that's that's compared? Comparative to uh, what you call it, uh, to Cortex A, like a V8 or something? something like that. Well, I the, mean, the I is different from the M, right? Is it yeah. like the M is a small design, yeah. and the A is much bigger, right? Right. And you have the whole thing planned out or well, done the, already, or? So the ISA does not presuppose an architecture. So in the microarchitecture and implementation of the CPU is what is what you and I, if we started our chip company tomorrow in your kitchen, we would need to decide what kind of a processor are we looking to design. Is it a big, uh, you know, out of order machine, deeply pipeline? What is it? Are we going after server? Are we going after low end embedded? What are we trying to do? Uh, so the ISA specification itself does not presuppose a particular architecture. So the ISA it's is just the, the ISA. What? Well, you, you use different, the I, ISA is modular. It, it is uh, released in uh, standard extensions depending on what you're trying to develop. So uh, in this device, I'm not sure, if, uh, not 100% sure, but it's probably the base integer, multiply divides, maybe atomics, that's it. 
um, as, that's what you would use typically in an embedded device. And you know, then you'd add floating points, maybe uh, double or quad position floating points, maybe some vector extensions, depending on what you're doing for your server class. And these extensions are open source and ready and available? Or yeah, so they're in the process of being uh, exactly. designed? Exactly, so there's, very, there's various stages of completion on, on these uh, extensions. IMAFD, which is referred to as sort of the general class CPU that would have a, typically have an MMU and you'd run Linux on, uh, that's very well defined and, and released. I is the only thing that was has been frozen 100% in, in, in cement. Uh, right now. The, the base integer uh, extension, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, A is for atomics, M is for multiply, F is for single precision floating point, D double precision floating point, there's a Q for quad. So there's a bunch of other extensions. And all of that uh, work is is very well baked and being released by the foundation, ratified actually in the coming months. So actually some of these companies might be uh, saying, hey, I'll take care of this this part, and maybe they'll release it open source or something? They can do that? Or Absolutely. Do they all work together? Or Absolutely, no? yeah, no, very much so. Or so is it somebody only in the risk foundation that does that? So the foundation, is 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 really these guys, right? These so guys, yeah. it's the member it's the member companies that that form that create that are the foundation. So the the technical committee and marketing committee within the foundation have task groups that work on different extensions. The marketing committee have, would have task groups that works on work on coming to events like this, making sure that we have a presence at you know embedded world and other events like it. Help with the, the workshops that we run. Um, but it, within the technical committee, then there would be. You know, a privileged architecture ex extension or a, ta a task group. There would be a memory model task group, a vector extensions task group, security task group, and so on. We have a, uh, like a dozen different task Do groups you have that to are at. Uh, no, no. Director. Well, uh, I or help. Is it just I help. Like everybody does what they want. Well, there. You know, we have uh, contribution rules and a membership agreement and bylaws in terms of to govern how we how we act and, and how we participate. Um, and then we have chairs for each of the task groups and the and within the technical committee, and technical committee chair actually is from Sci-5, uh, the, the company with this chip, a gentleman named Yun Sip Lee, who's one of the principal authors of the work. He's a graduate, a PhD graduate from Berkeley, and he's the chair of the technical committee. And uh, Mike Semi, who's a, another member, um, a gentleman named uh, Ted Marina, chairs the marketing committee on, on, on the marketing side. Do they pay a fee to be a part of the foundation? Yeah, there's very various membership classes. Do you talk about how much it is? Yeah, yeah, it's published yeah. on the web. So it's live on the website. The yeah, it goes. So for nonprofit uh, research labs and universities, it's twenty five hundred dollars a year, and then you come and participate in any of the task groups yeah. you want. For commercial companies, there's a silver, gold, and platinum level that range from five ten to twenty five k. And you get different privileges within the foundation depending on the, the membership level. And do you use that money to hire more engineers or not yet? We have no engineers. And we no. have no you intent have to have engineers. Yeah. We, so do, just we use it to educate. Yeah, to, we use it to educate, have events like this, okay. uh, and run the foundation. All right. Can we walk uh, around? So you have some, uh, yeah. some of the sure. around here. A whole bunch of demos, right? Yeah, so, so some are running on uh, uh, simulation, what do you call it, uh, FPGAs kind of, but yeah, some are running software. on actual so hardware. Right, so where's Guy? Uh, sorry, maybe where's Guy? Where did he, where did he let's go around. Uh, let's, let's go. So we did see the Ant Micro, you were having it right here. Uh, no, that's just one of the things that Ant Micro has done. Yeah. That's not their, their demo over here. Okay. Uh, so it'd be worthwhile for you to do everybody. Yeah. When they're available. Let me, let me jump over yeah. here. 50, hey, it's good. Can, can, uh, can we film your, your demo right here? Yeah. All right. So, so what are you showing here? Um, so here we're showing off yeah, GAP eight, which is a um, what we what we call an IoT application processor. Um, so is this a, a RISC V hardware? Yes. It's it's a processor which is destined for um, doing content understanding applications, is analyzing it, images, sounds, motions um, on battery power. So it's based on a RISC V based core. So there's actually nine RISC V cores in it. Yeah. Uh, you can see the diagram there of it. It's basically an MCU and then a calculation engine, which can be used for doing things like convolutional networks. But it's yeah. a flexible device, so it can do loads of different yeah. types of algorithms. It's, um, it's based on an open source project called Pulp, 
which where the cores come from. Um, and uh, well, who's making the chips? We are. You are. Yes. So you're making the. We we actually make this chip. Yeah. We take the work of the whole project that we have a very close association with through our CTO, who's one of the founding members of it, and then we size that for this specific market. And the specific market is IoT sensors that are doing content understanding. So, so octa-core. It's, it's actually nine core. So nine this is core. Eight, eight core here, and an extra core here. And then we also have a hardware convolution engine, which allows us to do very low power uh, neural network uh, processing inside this. And is this taped out? Or? It, it was taped out in Christmas, and we got the first chips back uh, a couple of weeks back. Uh, so we're still actually running a demo here on FPGA. What software but, can you run on it? You can't um, run Linux, right? No, it's, it's, it's not that kind of device. It's like a sense, if you think of a microcontroller, you're going to run a very lightweight uh, real-time OS. We've actually ported ARM Embed onto it. We also have another uh, OS called Pulp OS, which comes out of the Pulp project. And we will have uh, free Artos on it when we release the SDK. This board is kind of like an Arduino form factor board. That you make, uh, the company makes? That we make, uh, that, will that has the uh, GAP8 on it. And that can be ordered on our website now. Um, and so. Green Waves, uh, the, the core competency of, you, of your company is uh, in the embedded world? Yes, absolutely. But it's also in, in the semiconductor. We're, we're a fabulous semiconductor company. So we're taking open source IP, we're combining it with um, with our expertise and then focusing that in on a specific market. But you also do, you do ARM, you do other things? No, no, we, we sell we sell GAP8, which is this chip, and it's RISC-5 based. So you do company? We're three years old. Three years old? Yeah. You're focused on the... Selling this, one. selling this chip. That one there. Where are you based? We're based in Grenoble in France, just outside. It's a kind of... The, the, uh, is, right? Exactly, uh, and a lot of the people uh, who work for the company are XST. Yeah. Is ST part of the foundation, or? Uh, I don't believe so. I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. Right. Um, but risk five, risk five for us is incredibly important because it's without risk five, we basically wouldn't be able to make the product. Um, you would be what? We would not be able to make the product without risk five. It gives us the ability to actually produce a, um, a system on chip uh, at a capital efficiency, which we wouldn't have if we were licensing IP from someone else. How did you actually make the chip? Is it in the fab somewhere? It's designed in-house, obviously, and then uh, the actual fab is TSMC. Uh, we produce in a 55 nanometer process. And uh, mass production, how soon? Um, as I said, the, the boards are available now. Engineering samples are, uh, sorry, the boards are available to order now. They'll ship in April, first shipments in April. Engineering samples, first shipments in April. And we expect to be in production in Q4. All right, and uh, is this, the, this chip going to be compatible with the software that goes on with other RISC-V chips? Absolutely, it can run, it can run standard RISC-V code. You compile it with GCC, C, C++. Uh, you can pass straight to that. But we've added some extra instructions, which are these instructions which allow us to be more energy efficient processing things like content understanding applications. How many are you in the company? We're 15. 15? 15, 1-5. 15. 1-5. Right. Um, and who's the investor? Or um, a mix of private and uh, institutional investors. We raised 3.1 million euros in uh, August. And if this works out, you're going to be uh, in all kinds of IoT products, or what are you going to be in? We, we want to be very focused in this, this range of IoT devices that are doing uh, content understanding. So, for example, uh, things which are analyzing uh, a particular area and seeing is it full, is it half empty, is it empty, Ca people counting type applications, uh, keyword spotting, so we can do on on device, we can do the full keyword spotting stack. So everything from uh, the no echo cancellation, noise reduction, through to feature extraction, through to the neural network, be it convolutional deep neural network uh, work to do keyword cool. spotting. All right, awesome. Great. Thanks a lot. Good to meet you. Thank you. Jump here. Let's check these guys out over here. Uh, so it, it's all hardware dispatch. The vectors have a built in scheduler hey, generator so, with the data, and that's what makes it more Yeah, I'm busy. Let me jump uh, so, to these guys over there. Why not? Hey, can I, can I jump in here? Yes, please do. 
So, so what do you do uh, in the risk plane? So we are Ultrasoc Technologies and we provide uh, run control and analytics for uh, the RISC-V processor. We have developed uh, the run control uh, with the working group and we've decided to take the lead on getting tracing coding for uh, the RISC-V processor which will bring the RISC-V to much more uh, potential customers than we have at the moment. So um, that means uh, you, you're part of uh, helping out build out the ecosystem, the open source requirements to, to get it, to get to more advanced chipsets. Or yeah, so to more advanced chipsets, but also to make sure that uh, everyone has has got the tools that they're used to in the current standard uh, processor world in the RISC-V environment, so that they can actually make sure that their um, the environment they're used to is not being degraded when they move to a RISC-V processor. So it's filling out the ecosystem to make it much easier for people to move across to. So uh, Ultrasoc is doing lots of stuff with the, with the ARM and with other things? Yes, we, we support uh, ARM, MIPS, Tensilica. We're working with Synopsys on an ARC integration. We have lots of other customers who are using proprietary uh, uh, processes. We can work with all of them, and that's one of our unique features. Like tools? Tools to develop chips or... Yeah, it's to look at the whole chip. So one of the unique things about EDA? us... Well, IP, so we put IP onto chips, and these uh, then give you the insight into what is going on in your chip, and interaction between various things uh, on the chip that may be killing your performance, may be causing you power problems, etc. that you want to go forward on. All right, okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, Let's jump over here. Um, let me jump from there. So, right, let me, uh, let me see here. Let me see. What do you see here? Some, some stuff. Uh, right, so we were checking this one out. It's uh, yeah. Okay. Here, here's, I think it's an FPGA. So, putting it on the FPGA is also fairly easy. Um, this it comes down to a tool problem. Once you build the processor, uh, you want to package it up so that other people can use it. And so you need to use a tool like uh, IPI or IP Integrator for Xilinx or QSIS for Altera. And that's a system build tool. So it allows you to drag and drop blocks and connect those blocks together. So we packaged up our CPU so that it, builds, it turns it into a block like that. And that makes it easier to build a system on it. And 